Is it possible to break into marketing without a marketing degree? Yes. Of all the, the ones, marketing degree is probably the least required. Of all the business disciplines, 100% agree. I agree. I think a marketing degree, again, I've said I learned it all from one class. Most of it was useless. Uh, all the ad agencies, they love to hire outside of marketing degrees. They love to hire people with diverse backgrounds and different things, because that's how they get there. I mean, I, I really think good marketers come from anywhere, bro. And honestly, it's about people who are not stuck up and willing to learn and willing to just suck it up and learn about something they don't care about. <laughs> like, if you're in an ad agency and you get a soap account or whatever, you gotta learn what people care about with soap. You gotta actually think about it. You gotta dive into the blogs and the TikToks and the You gotta understand. That's what I've seen is a great marketer. People that truly try to understand what the customer's thinking. You know what's crazy? I was reading this today. I was reading, um, you guys know the brand Chili's? Chili's restaurants like a dying fucking fast casual brand they've turned it all around chili's in the past like let's say year and a half has legitimately made a deep deep investment in like tiktok new branding marketing upgrading the stores they've been listening to employees so they've been changing some of the practices like making things easier for the workflow they've been emphasizing their price point versus fast food everyone's bitching about fast food prices which they should because it's expensive so they're like hey you can get like the same thing at chili's a full meal rather than go to McDonald's and pay 14 bucks for it. And so it's working. What I want you to know is like that, that's a old ass stoke, foggy ass brand. They just knuckled down. Whoever their marketers are did a great job. That's what I'm saying. They, they turned Chili's around. Their stock doubled. They doubled in the past like six months. So I don't know, it's possible. And you, but the thing is, if you want to be a good marketer, you have to find that exciting. <laughs> you have to find it exciting to be like, okay, I'm on the Chili's account. How do we make chilies exciting? And if you don't, like to me, I think that's interesting. But if you don't care about that, then agencies are gonna suck for you and you're gonna have to find an in-house marketing job at a company you love, which is harder. Does it make sense for NVIDIA to pass Apple and MarkCap or is it all bad? So NVIDIA actually isn't ahead of Apple anymore because Apple did a really sneaky trick. So Apple had a presentation recently where they talked about AI, which they call Apple intelligence. <laughs> and, you know, there was some hype in the stock leading into this announcement, but the announcement, to be honest, was a bit underwhelming. It basically said, hey, we're Apple. We're kind of late to the AI game. We don't have anything that special. We're going to partner with ChatGPT. They're going to be our AI solution. That's basically what it said. I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing special, right? It wasn't a major announcement. And the stock took an understandable hit. After the announcement, it wasn't doing very well. And then the very next day, Apple's $110 billion stock buyback kicked in. <laughs> the one they announced back in March. And so all of a sudden, it seemed like the news was great. Like if you didn't watch the announcement, all of a sudden the stock started mooning because they started buying back $110 billion in their own stock. And so Apple is now past Microsoft. It's back to number one. This is the sort of the dip from the announcement. And then it just starts zooming and again it's because they're they're just doing huge buybacks i think they just announced they're upping their uh dividend tim cook's good at the whole financialization part of it i mean 110 billion dollar buyback is like unheard of it's massive apple prints cash every single month they just they have too much cash to want to do it so they just buy back their own stock but but what do i have to say the reason i bring this up is because it's very important so there's um is it xlk yeah it is xlk you know you guys know if you buy like the, if you buy the s p 500 it's buying a little piece of every one of those 500 stocks. Well, some people don't buy that, but they buy QQQ or XLK. And those are ETFs that focus on a certain sector. So this one just buys a whole bunch of tech, of tech stocks, but it's very popular. Like XLK is in a lot of retirement funds. It's in a lot of whatever. And the thing is the way XLK balances the money it splits is that it buys a high percent of the number one stock high percent of the number two stock, like it's like 7.5%, 7.5%, and then like 2.5% of the number three stock. And Apple was this close to falling to number three behind Nvidia. And that's right when they did their buyback <laughs> to shoot back up to the top and be rebalanced to number one. Because if Apple gets rebalanced to the third place spot, XLK here is gonna have to sell billions of Apple stock and buy billions of Nvidia stock. <laughs> and Apple's very nervous about that because again, that all that stuff has compounding effects, it's just bad. And so, yeah, that's something they're thinking about. I'm just saying this is something that's on Tim Cook's mind. And one of the reasons they timed their buyback and one of the reasons they're making sure to stay balance wise, the number one market cap in this fund. How do you feel about buybacks? So the point of a corporation, right, is to make money and return it to the shareholders. That's like the idea, that's the idea. And normally they would do that by like, hey, 
we bought a hundred dollars of apples. We sold it for apples. The wrong word because we're thinking of apple. We bought a hundred dollars of oranges. <laughs> And we sold it for 150. We pay employees, or whatever. We have $25 left. Now we're gonna split that amongst all our shareholders. Everybody gets money. We did our job. That's the idea. That's what a corporation is supposed to do. However, when they do that, everyone that gets their little piece of the orange money gets taxed. <laughs> and they're sad about it because they're all rich people. So they go, oh, I got free money, but I don't want to get a tax on it. That's sad. So what they prefer is that the orange company takes that $25 left over and buys back their own stock which makes the stock value go up. And now the rich guy that owns the stock doesn't get any cash, but their stock is worth more. So they're worth more on paper, but they don't have to pay any taxes. Now, eventually they have to sell that and, and make the gain and, and pay some taxes, but that's a much lower tax rate and much far in the future. So that's why people love buybacks. That's not, I mean, that's one reason why shareholders love buybacks. When I own Nvidia, I want them to do buybacks, not dividends because I don't want cash. I want the stock to keep mooning. The number two reason is that CEOs use it. So if you're a CEO of Orange Co, right? And you have some money left over and you get a big bonus if your stock hits a certain level, what are you gonna do? You're gonna give the money back to people or are you gonna take the money and buy your stock to juice it up so you get your big paycheck? That's the real reason buybacks are shady is that CEOs use them. They're basically just taking the company as a piggy bank to buy more stock to boost their compensation package. I think the first part is fine, it's whatever, but the second part is really, uh, well, the first part's probably bad for society because people dodge taxes. And then the second part is bad because it's CEOs abusing it. How is the stock's price calculated? Every second of every day, people are trying to buy and sell it, right? If it's public, uh, it's based on the last traded price. If a stock is trading for 46 bucks and you're like, it's worth more than that, you'll buy it. <laughs> if you think it's worth less than that, then, you will, then, you'll, then you'll sell. Or you worth more than that, you'll sell. That's what, I'm saying. what if no one wants to sell? So rare that's ever happened. If no one wants to sell, the price goes up. Do you know what I'm saying? If everybody's holding their shares and no one wants to sell at 46 bucks, then someone's like, well, I'll offer 47. And then if no one wants to sell, then I'll we'll offer 48. <laughs> and eventually someone cracks and someone sells. And that's when the price, that's, that's how the price is determined. There's a price where someone wants to sell and there's a price where someone wants to buy. So we really should hodl. If you think the point of this speech is to be like, yeah, we really should all buy GameStop stock and hold it, then, then no, then that's not, <laughs> you misunderstood what I've said. What if someone sells for 10X price to the stock go up for a split second? Yes, but who would do that, right? If the market is trading a stock at 40 bucks, why would you come in and say, I'll buy it for 400? <laughs> Why would you do that? As a retail trader, I don't think you, you could. They would just pocket the difference. Do you know what I'm saying? If I go to Charles Schwab or whatever, and I'm like, hey, I want to buy this stock for 400. I don't care what it trades at. I want to buy it for 400. They'll just take your money and then buy it at the normal price. <laughs> it won't even hit the market. What's the difference between exercising options and selling stocks? An option is exactly what it sounds like. It's an option to buy or sell a stock at a certain by a certain period of time. So exercising is taking advantage of that and buying the stock. Like a call option is a bet that a stock is going to go up. It's saying I can buy the stock at a certain price by a certain period of time. If the stock is a higher than that price in that time period, then you can exercise the option, buy at the cheap price you set, and then immediately sell it for the higher price that the market is giving. It's like saying, okay, let me give you a call option. Let's say you and I are going to go to a Pokemon card meetup, <laughs> a big swap meet. And we don't know what Charizards are gonna cost there. We don't know. And so I pay you some money. I said, you know what? We don't know what's gonna cost, but I'm gonna give you a hundred bucks up front to be able to buy a Charizard from you for $300,000. <laughs> now, if we get to the fucking, and you're like, all right, I'll take that bet. I'll do it. I'll take your call. Then we get to the swap meet and Charizards cost $500,000. Well then bam, I exercise my call option and I pay you 300K and he has to give me a $500,000 Charizard. That's the win. That's what your dream is, okay? What could also happen is I get there and Charizards cost a hundred grand. And I'm like, I have this useless call option and it's worthless and I'm not, I'm not gonna actually, I'm not gonna pay him 300 grand for what I can buy for hundred grand. So that, that's what options are, right? It's just a bet about a price in a certain period of time and exercising it is actually pretty rarely done. Most people just resell the option to someone else because the option is worth something, especially if the, if, if, you can use it immediately to make money. So you don't actually exercise it, which means like using it to get the shares. You're talking about who? You're talking about Roaring Kitty? So Roaring Kitty, to my knowledge, did not exercise his options. To my knowledge, Roaring Kitty sold all his options at a profit and then bought some shares of GME. He has less exposure today than he has had previously. 
I know all of the apes were talking about how he's going to exercise all those options and suddenly they're going to need to come up with millions of shares of GME. And I think he sold them all and then bought about 4 million new shares. He had about 12 million plus in options. He just sold those, bought four. But they are saying that tomorrow's the big day. So I guess we'll find out. We'll find out. They're, they're saying T plus one, baby. But I know one thing. If I know one thing about the apes is that if tomorrow is not Moas, if for whatever reason, the mother of all short squeezes doesn't happen tomorrow and GME doesn't go to a thousand a share, they are going to be like, oh, we were wrong. They're going to give up. I know the apes well, and I know they are, they will easily take this new evidence into account and change their opinion. So if tomorrow doesn't work out, they're going to be like, oh, sorry. I think we must've misstepped.